Hey, Scott. Yes. I was going to say, I have uh, saw that we've gotten so much product in that they've almost boxed in your camper. <laughs> I know, that's, a good, crazy. that's a good thing. Barbagene, the vintage airstream is protected by a fortress of that's inventory. Right. That's right. That's right. So Mike Wiesner's on first. He says, howdy. Do they say howdy in Arizona, Mike? Hey, howdy, partner. Howdy, partner. Pilgrim? Yeah. Partner. P-A-R-D-N-E-R. Pilgrim? Why did you say pilgrim. pilgrim? You don't know about Pilgrim with Wayne? With John, the, Wayne? John Wayne? John Wayne. <laughs> and Mike Wiesner, pilgrim. he does. Yeah. He does. He says howdy. You wear howdy, a cowboy pilgrim? hat when you say that, Mike? What's that? I said, does he wear the cowboy hat to go along with it when he says that to people? Uh, Wiesner doesn't need a cowboy hat. He could wear one, but he's like a steely-eyed missile man. You know, he, he flew T-38. I think it was T-38s. Is that right, Mike? T-38 jets? It's a trainer. Anyway, Mike Wiesner's on. Book Davies is on. T-38s and A-70s. Wow. Edward, Eduardo Simone, son. Cameron Gillis. Hi, everybody. Book Davies says, I don't have a cowboy hat. My hat is sort of like Clint Eastwood's in Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Flat top, flat rim, brim. Mm When we look up at the night sky, we can only see a small percentage of the stars that are around us. That's because our eyes can only see so far. Telescopes on Earth have helped us get a better view of the stars by collecting more light than our eyes can see, allowing us to see even further. But the view from those telescopes gets distorted by Earth's atmosphere, 
That's why we see the stars twinkle. To get rid of the distortion of the atmosphere, astronomers imagined building a telescope the size of a school bus to go into space. The result was the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990. Today, it orbits the Earth 340 miles above the surface. Many of the galaxy's Hubble photographs are millions of light years away from Earth. Light years are a measurement for distance in space, related to the time it takes light to travel from one place to another. A light year is the distance light travels in one year. Hubble photographed the Whirlpool Galaxy that is 25 million light years away from Earth. The light from that galaxy took 25 million years to travel to Earth. This means that the light Hubble sees from the Whirlpool Galaxy is 25 million years old. We aren't seeing the galaxy as it exists today. We're seeing the galaxy as it existed 25 million years ago. A Hubble astronomer had a really interesting idea to point Hubble at an apparently blank spot of sky to see what we could see. That empty patch of sky turned out to be filled with galaxies, much more distant than we'd ever seen before. Some of the galaxies were baby galaxies born just after the creation of the universe in the Big Bang. The universe is a never-ending source of wonder, largely because of the things the Hubble Space Telescope has taught us during its years in space. Hubble studies our own solar system, like storms on Mars, the rings of Saturn, and aurora on Jupiter. Hubble also photographs the birth and death of stars, and has uncovered thousands of new galaxies in the universe. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Scott has at least one cowboy hat, maybe two. So anyhow, uh, it was fun talking about it was fun talking about uh, cowboys, cowboy hats and uh, and the fact that Mike Wiesner still says howdy because we do, too, here in Arkansas. So, you know, so there you go. They say howdy in uh, Virginia, Jerry, or no? You can. You can't. Well, it's not <laughs> illegal, right? <laughs> We say we say hey or or hello. You know, it depends. Oh, hello. Yeah. Howdy is a lot more friendly, I think. Hi. Yeah. Well, anyhow. Yeah. So um, today uh, it's Tuesday, and we've got Global Star Party tonight. It's our 59th Global Star Party. This is Jerry's 167th episode of the Open Go To Community, and um, yeah, he's been leading us through uh you know understanding how to do science with your telescope so that he's going to yep. dive a little bit more into uh, the pro-am stuff uh that uh that he's uh, involved with and yeah i'm, I'm lucky to be a pace setter because we're, this is the founding show of our network right this is the that's first right. show that we we developed that's right that's right open go to community was it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and uh we, did it, like, we were doing it every day for a while so yeah Right. Mm -hmm. So, 
And Annie uh, is with us. Uh, Annie, what's happening in uh, the um, Explore Alliance? Well, it seems like things are changing quickly, uh, uh, spur of the moment kind of thing, but that's a good, especially on our calendar. So that's a really good thing. It's nice to have some some change up. Um, I'm sure some of some of our viewers will be a little bit upset about some shows not being on, but but we have some great um, replacements. So uh, we just updated the calendar. Um, let me see here. Uh, so we just updated the calendar. Um, tomorrow we will not be having uh, First Light Chronicles and then Explore Alliance Minutes. So we're going to have uh, Tom and Linda Spilker on uh, on our Explore Now uh, show. They're they're the, they're going to talk about the Voyager missions. Um, it's going to be a great show. Which then moved Cameron uh, Gillis down to six o'clock. So Cam Astronomy will be at six, and then we're going to have Caitlin Aaron's at uh, for seven months of science at seven. So it's going to be a very 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 busy day oh, and yeah. some great shows that are going to be on. So, um, yeah. but um, we were just talking about the astronomy. There's a lot going to happen between September and October. So the astronaut, the astronomical league is going to have a live um, event on the 24th. And then we're going to have the moon party, uh, International Observe the Moon Night kickoff um, in October. Um, this whole week in October, the 4th through the 10th, is uh, world, uh, is Women in Space. It's a World Space mm -hmm. Week. Um, so uh, we'll have to see what we're going to do with that. But um, of course, then we have Caitlin Aarons that, that week. Um, but then again, in October 15th, we have the Astronomical League again for live. Um, and then they do their 75th anniversary. So we were just talking about that, that they have their 75th anniversary in November. So um, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've still got to fit, fill in our regular shows. So some of this stuff will move stuff around. Um, and then, of course, I couldn't believe it. I was doing a calendar. Our cal I do. I do the calendar on an Excel spreadsheet and then I convert it over to this and I was already putting Thanksgiving and Christmas on here. I was very, very shocked. <laughs> right. I'm like, it's already coming. It's coming. So, but um, we have a lot of stuff that's going to start happening and um, some, you know, so it's, it's nice to, you know, I know we still have COVID and we still have social distancing and a lot of things going on. And, and of course, we've already had an event canceled. Stars and Sauce got canceled because of yeah. because of COVID. So we have, you know, we have some barriers and we want people to be safe and, you know, feel safe and do what's best for them. And so uh, but we also want to be able to, to oh, we, get we want know, everybody connected to the yeah. astronomical community. So, yeah. and so know, we're, we're trying to play yeah. that role and. Uh, great organizations like the Astronomical League, the Night Sky Network, um, several others are helping along the way, you know, as well. So we have, uh, you know, the, uh, you might have mentioned the International Observe the Moon Night, mm -hmm. uh, which yeah. is what, October 9th? Is the, it's, yeah. It's, that is uh, the kickoff. We're actually doing it in, in advance of the week, okay, okay, of International Observe the Moon Night or International Observe the Moon Week. That is a NASA program. And so we've got um, uh, Vivian White from Night Sky Network. She is heading this up with, uh, um, uh, you know, NASA scientists and people that are involved in educational outreach with NASA are going to be uh, running this uh, particular program, which is going to be a lot of fun. We are looking for people who want to share a live view of the moon with your telescope. So if you if you want to do that, um, you know, uh, certainly get in touch with uh, with Annie through you can send an email to explore alliance at explore scientific dot com and uh, and you can sign up for that. And uh, we're expecting a large audience a worldwide audience for this. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, Tomorrow, uh, uh, and he probably also mentioned we have um, uh, uh, Linda Spilker. Uh, I've been talking about her for a couple of weeks now. Uh, Linda and her husband, Tom, who may also make this program uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Central, uh, we're going to have a special Explore Now presentation. Um, and uh, uh, Linda's 
Linda's journey starts off, she uh, is uh, graduating, um, I think from Caltech, she does an internship at JPL. At the time she is accepted for her internship, her first job is to work on the Voyager mission, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 missions. And then she goes off to work uh, as one of the principal scientists of the Cassini mission uh, to Saturn. And now that that is wound back down, well, you know, guess what? Voyagers were still being flown, still being controlled, still doing science, still all this stuff. And so she goes back full circle back to the Voyager mission, which she's on right now at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So that's uh, she'll be on with us. And hopefully her husband, Tom, will be on as well because they both worked uh, with uh, with the Voyager uh, programs. You know, they worked arm, you know, hand in hand with uh, 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 the likes of people like Carl Sagan and Ed Stone and many other legendary planetary scientists. Um, so that's very, very cool. Yeah. Um, but they're going to bring us, you know, the, it, I think the Voyagers uh, have been flying for 44 years. Um, and uh, the fact they're still sending us information is just mind blowing to me, you know. They've already gone past something called the hydrogen wall. Um, you know, they're out of the influence of the sun's gravity uh, and they're flying in interstellar space. So um, that's just so, it just makes me dizzy thinking about it. Um, what else? What, what am I forgetting here, Annie? Um, I did want to announce I finally have the survey winners. I really appreciate everybody that um, took time and participated in our PMC8 survey. Um, we, you know, we have a new um, software, a new system. And so it was really nice to be able to get some feedback from those that have, that have used stuff in the past or have updated their software or not. And so um, because of that, we, we wanted to draw three names and give out some just some thank you prizes for taking oh. the time to do that. So um, yeah. our our first our first place uh, prize was an uh, either an, an eighty was an eighty two degree thirty millimeter or a fourteen millimeter eyepiece, and that's going to go to Mark Ellingson, I think is how you say it. And so okay. I'll yeah, so I'll email him. And then, All right. Uh, yep. And then our second place was a USB power bank with the with the red LED light, and that's going to mm -hmm. go to that's going to go to Omar. Ra Raw, raw man, R A H M A N. I'm probably ramen. butchering it, and yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Blame it on that. Southern, blaming on that southern accident. Ac accident. Accident. Yes. Accident, <laughs> accident. That says howdy. I'm putting Boy. my cowboy hat back on now. Yeah. I don't think it's I've a, enough a southern accident. <laughs> accident. Yes. <laughs> I could really do that. I actually could really probably talk really, right. really, really southern. Okay. And then the third place uh, prize was an Astrolite, uh, 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 an Astrolite red flashlight uh, with, okay. the plant, with the planisphere. And that goes to Frank Rich. The Will Tyrion planisphere. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah. And so we, uh, so I'll get the emails out and send out for that. Um, and um, I've, updated everybody about their prints that everybody's won the astrophotography contest we've got those 18 by 24 prints mm -hmm. that we're going to start getting printed and sent out so i'm trying to get caught up on some things and um so if, if you have any questions or you're missing something or you're just want to talk to me i just email me or call me <laughs> i don't mind to do that so but um but yeah other than that i mean things are going pretty good we you know we're we're trekking along uh, uh, we we've, we've got yeah. we've had quite a few members in the last week or so so Great. it's good it's going good so um Excellent. i did want to point out scott said something about yesterday somebody thought that you had to be a platinum member to get the skies up magazine you do not have to be a member it skies up is free um and True. so and so you can yeah but we're you but it's a great publication for the Explorer Alliance members yes. because, uh, you know, we put lots of information in there, stuff that's going on globally, you know, so, um, you know, Explorer Alliance is not just a USA program, you know. Um, it's probably the first uh, global astronomy magazine, isn't it? I'd like to say yes, but I don't know that to be a fact, <laughs> yeah. you know, so. 
Uh, you know, I know that there have been international editions of things like Sky and Telescope for sure. Um, probably Astronomy Magazine is considered to be, uh, you know, global, you know, people subscribe to it, I'm sure, all over the world. Um, right. So um, I remember I used to subscribe to Japan's Astronomy Magazine. Now, I couldn't read it, but I loved all the photos because there was a lot of astrophotography being done in Japan. They were a little bit ahead of the curve of doing uh, suburban level uh, astrophotography, you know, um, uh, you know, and they used mostly refractors uh, in Japan, uh, which is true. Um, but uh, they they love they love astrophotography and they would do stunning work from, you know, Tokyo, you know, so uh, just really cool stuff. Before we uh, switch over, Jerry, I'm just going to recognize some of the people that are on our program in the audience today. And of course, we talked with Mike Wiesner and, and learned what howdy men, men, means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Book Davies is on. Cameron Gillis is watching. Um, uh, Cameron will be on tomorrow with uh, Cam Astronomy. Um, Eduardo Simone uh, saying hello and... Um, uh, Book Davies is saying he doesn't have a cowboy hat, but he's got a hat sort of like Clint Eastwood's hat. That's kind of, he was a cowboy, I think, you know, so. Um, and Eduardo's excited because he says he might actually get a clear night tonight the first time in a month. So it's mm -hmm. clear here too. So that's, that's nice. Clear and hot. Um, yep. Harold Locke is watching. Good times Tuesday. Uh, hello, Stargazers. Um, Probably mentioned Book Davies is watching. Beatrice Hines. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, and uh, we came on a little bit late today because we were just kind of scrambling a little bit, getting ready. I couldn't find my cowboy hat, so that was important, right? Right. Um, and I'm to my normal things. I didn't really have a scheduled topic today. I, don't, I think I run out of scheduled topics. I got to send a bunch more to Annie to get on the schedule. Yeah, that's right. And you guys in the audience, if you want to hear something specifically from Jerry, you know, um, we're all ears, of course. Right. Um, and so is your dog. Uh, Harold Locke yeah. is on. Um, uh, let's see. And who else is watching? Oh, we have a guy. Um, his his uh, handle is, is dog says. So he says, hi, I love your channel. Thank you, man. That's great. Um, Beatrice Hines says, Scott, I have a white hat that I also like to wear during solar observation. It's not a real cowboy hat, but the model comes near it. <laughs> That's cool. Um, and who else here? Lots of comments from... I think that's kind of... Well, I know that's not it. it, but that's, you know, not everybody um, shouts with us, but, uh, but it's cool to, it's cool when you do, you know. Um, okay. Oh, and Russell Atkinson. Hi from Bolton, England. And someone called the Dad Frequency. He's in Fayetteville. I don't know who the Dad Frequency is. Maybe he comes into our shop sometimes. Um, Shailendra Sharma from uh, Linda, London is on. Um, and who else? John Barry. John Barry. That yeah. sounds like some, some new names In out Chattanooga. there. Chattanooga. Yeah. At least yeah. Not. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. And Aaron Thompson is watching. Oh, Aaron. How you doing, Aaron? Yep. Yeah. And Santil Kumar Nagapen. I hope I pronounced that right. But um, anyways, welcome everybody that's uh, new and chatting with us. Uh, we love it. And um, so I'm going to turn this over to Jerry, and he's going to get you uh, revved up and prepared to do some uh, real science with your telescopes. And also what you can do with the data. What good is the data if you don't share it, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So first, let me share my screen. 
<laughs> Let me see. Where do I want to go first? I guess I'm going to change the page here where I'm at on my website, on the web pages. I'm going to share a bunch of web, web pages uh, talking about how you can be a part of a pro-am collaboration or just share your data with groups that, that want your science data uh, from your observing. Let me see, I gotta stop that first. I need to change my page. Let's see. I don't have a generic page to start with, so. I'm like just a PowerPoint with... generic page? No, no, with a website. I've got a bunch of different groups that I'm gonna be talking about, different yeah. pages. Oh, I see. Oh, I guess I could, well. I'll end with the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. I won't start with it, but I'll start with the Minor Planet Center. Okay, so let me um, let me share that. These are all groups um, or organizations that want science data, right? Right. So I've got a little notepad. I was I was typing notes notes before my show notes before the show, and uh, to talk about different things. So you see the. Uh, See the web page? Yeah. yeah. Is it blocked in any way? I don't know if I'm. It says Minor Planet Center. Yep. It's so this the is the main. Shaped, uh... So I just want to say a couple things before we get into the web pages, the websites for the different groups. Uh, so there's there's two different types of pro am collaboration. I just I just uh, made this up before the show. One is a term direct pro -am collaboration, where you join a team of professional astronomers in a joint project uh, to do science and you provide observations to the professionals. And if they use your data, you know, what, what's in it for you? What's in it for you is that you get to be listed as a contributor on any papers that get written that use your data to do the research. So that's a cool thing. That's uh, and then you've got indirect pro am collaboration where you can provide data to a lot of groups uh, that collect science data that professionals and amateurs alike have access to the data. And if they use your data in a professional uh, way in terms of writing a paper or something, then you get credit for it that way also. So most most uh, amateurs are familiar with that second group where you can provide data and you can join these groups directly and interact with all the members. Um, these are groups such as the Association of Variable Star Observers, AAVSO, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, the ALPO. Uh, you've got the International Occultation Timing Association, which is called IOTA. And then you've also uh, another group that's really good to join is a, called the Society for Astronomical Sciences or SAS. And I'll, yeah. I'll show these pages here in a minute. The main, the main uh, I've got two or three main professional groups that uh, amateurs contribute a lot of data to. And the first one is the International Astronomical Union Minor Planet Center. And that's, that's this website that I'm showing right here. The Minor Planet Center. So you, you contribute your, your observations of minor planets, astrometry and photometry observations. The other, uh, the other one, which is really, um, really the most recent one in some ways, is the uh, dealing with exoplanets, is the MIT uh, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite Follow-Up observing program, which is called TFOP, T-F-O-P, and I'll show you their page also. So those are two major uh, groups, professionals that take your data and they create peer reviewed uh, documents and, and data sets that you can download as an amateur or a professional to use the data that's collected by astronomers all over the country. Uh, I don't want to forget to mention the American Astronomical Society, which is a, a society that was originally for professional uh, uh, 
astronomers and teaching teachers. Uh, but it's also been opened up in the recent years to amateur astronomers. So the American Astronomical Society uh, is a large group of uh, astronomers. I would say quite a majority of the professional astronomers are members of that, I imagine. Is that correct, Scott? Aren't you on the team uh, yes. with them dealing with- Yeah, I'm uh, one of the, you know, as part of the advisory team, um, that is uh, formulating some of the things for the American Astronomical Society. Uh, admittedly, I, I wish I could have participated more than I did, um, but uh, we're we're in a process right now of, uh, of finalizing um, suggestions for the American Astronomical Society, which we hope gets um, uh, you know flowed into their uh, regular program because uh, there's a lot of great benefit for amateur astronomers in it, uh, which is a combination of getting them involved in pro-am projects, uh, mentoring, um, and also uh, getting amateur astronomers um, involved with uh, educational outreach and, you know, in a more scientific kind of way, you know, so um, it's, uh, you know, it's good stuff. And, uh, you know, I think that you're going to, you know, eventually want to get involved. Yeah, so that's, I've got that on the screen right now is their mission statement and vision statement about what they, what they, uh, what they're all about. They mm -hmm. want to, they want to share humanity's scientific understanding of the universe uh, within the astronomical community. And uh, I joined them about, I guess about two years ago. This is the second year I've been a member. But they've got a uh, special membership for amateur astronomers to join. Um, and their their website is aas.org. Uh, maybe you can share some of these website uh, yeah. uh, on, on the chat, whatever. So that's the AAS. Now, let me go back to the... Uh, Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center is basically the world's go-to place for anything dealing with minor planets. They, they, the International Astronomical Union is involved with not only uh, collecting the data from the from all the world's observatories on minor planets, but also in naming minor planets. Uh, they control the naming of celestial bodies. Not, I don't think. I think the IAU names everything in the universe, not just minor planets. I think they're involved with naming craters on the moon and Mars and other planets and mm -hmm. also a lot of different, any, anything that's given a name in the universe, I think it goes through the IAU, uh, International Astronomical Union. It's IAU.org, um, right? Mm -hmm. Let me go to that page so you can see. Is it dot, dot org, IAU.org? Yep. So that's another, all these, all these websites for these groups that I'm going to show you today are just great to go to and just browse around. Just click on all the different links and you'll find tons of information. If you're really interested in science, uh, in astronomy science, these are the places you go to to see what's going on today. Uh, you can see they've got a lot of, um, you know, a wealth of information on these websites. This just this one, you know, and then you've got uh, same thing with the AAS. They've got a ton of stuff to look at. Uh, but I start with the Minor Planet Center. Now, when you get closer to when you, what actually are you doing? What kind of work are you doing, for example, to contribute to the Minor Planet Center? Um, you're going to be doing uh, things like uh, observing, doing astrometry. We talked about astrometry of, of minor planets in previous episodes. So the position measurements that you take, uh, that you do with your minor planets, you're going to, you're going to uh, need to meet some criteria before you can submit them to the minor planet center, but you'll be able to send every one of your observations to them to use in the orbit calculations for minor planets, which is really cool. So you're contributing 
in terms of asteroids, you're contributing to keeping tra track of these objects in space because uh, the observations are very important because our orbits change over time and you need to do continuous follow-up uh, with minor planets to make sure you don't lose any of them. <laughs> you don't want them popping up out of nowhere, you know, maybe show up and hit the earth, you know, that's, that'd be a bad thing. Not that that's ever going to happen now since we've got such a, a large database of minor planets. You know, there's a, almost 800,000 minor planets in the catalog now that, that the orbits have Jeez. been uh, calculated. <clears throat> And it's gotten, uh, now there are professional observatories that do surveys that do nothing but look for minor planets and keep track of their, their orbits. But that doesn't stop anyone that wants to learn how to do that from doing that and contributing their observations. So that, so every little bit helps, no matter, you know, no matter how small, if you do five observations a year, that's great. They'll accept it and uh and you'll contribute you know if you do a thousand a year uh, a lot of amateur systems that aren't owned by universities a lot of these systems do a large amount of uh this type of work and contribute thousands of observations a year uh to the minor planet center that's just one one area you can get into um there's another uh good website called minorplanet.info uh right now they're uh they've got a temporary url i'm going to copy this into the chat scott so you'll have it to post all right um how do i get back let me stop my share real quick we have one uh, person watching Sent Hill as he says he's already a man. He's already a member of Alpo. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll talk about Alpo here in a minute because um, that's that's near to me too. All right. So I posted that link for the Minor Planets info. Okay. This is a good website. Yeah, there's a there's all kinds of neat information. Now minor here. Planets are something that amateurs can do a lot with. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not just not just astrometry, but photometry, which is basically measuring the current brightness of the. But but if you do a time series measurement, which means you do continuous measurements over uh, several you know hours and days, you can create a light curve and understand the. Uh, you can tell all kinds of stuff from the light just from the basic light curve of the minor planet, such as the uh, rotation rate. That's really cool when you think about it. you got this little point of light out there and you're looking at it rotate in time and space. You watch this asteroid, you know, like you see in the movies, you'll see these asteroids sitting there rotating around. You can actually measure that. It's cool. Which is really a cool thing. Yeah, you with know? your with your backyard with telescope. With your backyard telescope, you can measure the rotation rate of a minor planet pretty easily. Uh, it's just all in the technique and learning the procedure. You know, a lot, a lot of people have asked me, especially beginners, you know, if I would be, you know, sometimes I would be on uh, doing sidewalk astronomy or something. And there's always somebody out there that kind of yells out the window, hey, buddy, how powerful is that telescope? You know, they want to right. know the power of it. Well, gosh, one thing is it's powerful enough to see the uh, the tumbling action of a asteroid. OK, right. Yeah. Which, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty of course, amazing. Of course, that might just go straight over their head. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but right, right. But uh, one thing yeah. I want to point out is the Minor Planet Bulletin. That's part of the uh, the Minor Planet Bulletin is a newsletter of the Minor Planet section of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, or ALPO, which I'm a member of and also on the staff. And I've contributed to this uh, bulletin. It's a very it's a peer review uh newsletter or or journal i should say not newsletter it's a journal that both amateurs and professionals use to publish their work and uh, i want to bring up an example uh let's see can you see that yep i want to i want to this thing so this thing shows you light curves 
Oh, wow. Look at okay, that. Okay, so this is really detailed information for all these different types of, all the different asteroids. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the, now there's Apophis. That's a pretty famous Oh, yeah, that was an asteroid. That's the one that people point, thought was going to uh, hit us. Yeah, I was. You remember that? It was like, yeah. I mean, it was the a real, you know, warning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You might get hit. And, yep. So that's this is the kind of data you can you can find in this uh, bulletin. So that's just an example. Rotational period and light curve determination, you know. Mm hmm. And uh, I don't know, let's see if they've got, there's other things you can do also with the light curves. When you aggregate a bunch of different light curves at different times of the year, you can start to do shape. It's called shape modeling. I'm going to scroll is, through here. What does fast. that mean? Like the surface of it or the something? The surface, what the surface, a 3D model of the surface, basically. Right. I'm trying to, I, don't, I know this is probably aggravating as hell. Uh, I'm reading I it. To, I, I, yeah, I've learned to speed trying to, Yeah, okay. So here's an example. <laughs> okay here's an example of a shape model now, how in the heck do they do that now because when you're observing an asteroid you're looking at it at a specific aspect okay and it's like cutting a line through the asteroid at that time right and you're looking at it at different points in its or orbit so you're looking at a different aspects of the of the asteroids so you got at different angles basically is what i mean so you're looking at the light curve at that angle and then one at this angle and then one at that angle. And then you, there's modeling tools that put all that together and create these shapes. Mm -hmm. That's just a, a basic explanation. I'm not sure how accurate it is, but that's basically what it is. It takes different aspects, different light curves at different aspects and compiles it all into one shape. I don't know if there's another one here with the shape model, but you can see the is there First software station. out there that takes your light curves and yes. shape? Yep. Yep. Wow. And, and that's awesome. Specific. Yep, there is. And unfortunately, that's not free, but it's pretty inexpensive. So enough about minor planets. That's one that's right. one group. Yeah. Let's go to the AAVSO, which is another big group. They've been around for a long time. And they're interested in variable stars. It's the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Yes. Okay. And there's a lot of good data. They do, they do the same thing. They do photometric measurements of light and create light curves from stars. But the light curve of a star is very different. It tells you very different stuff than what a light curve of an asteroid would tell you, right? It's a yeah. light curve, but it tells you the inner workings of the star, okay? That's uh, that's what the light curves are for, and Amazing. what and and what's going on. Um, and I love their new website. You know. Yeah, they've so they've updated job. the website, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the oh, I'm trying to think what else I'm going to say about this. Um, they have great training programs. The choice co courses talk talk to you about you know, uh, all kinds of stuff uh, about variable stars. Mm -hmm. And uh, they actually have an exoplanet training course also, if you want to look at uh, exoplanets. I took that course about four years ago. And I was involved uh, four or five years ago with a couple of their online courses also, training, cool. uh, being a, a trainer for them. Um, that's the AAVSO. That's a great organization to join. AAVSO.org, right? AAVSO.org. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, an, a, a similar group that which we mentioned already that I that I belong to, I'm actually um, a previous assistant coordinator for lunar uh, topographical studies in ALPO. And currently I'm the uh, coordinator for, exo for the exoplanet section of the ALPO, which is a brand new section that we created this past year that I'm trying to start up and get everything uh, rolling on that. So I've been a member of the, AA the ALPO for probably about eight years now. And uh, if you're interested in and uh, especially any kind of planetary uh, imaging 
for lunar imaging, high resolution lunar planetary, providing those observations. Um, this is the this is the place that will take your observations. They have a gallery. This is something else that's cool. They've got galleries of all the observations that people have submitted um, uh, a over the years. ALPL stands for Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Right. And they got some real serious guys in here. Yeah, and they, they get into, I mean, they've got a great journal. It's called yeah. The Strolling Astronomer. But they get into very high-level details, uh, scientific information about the planets Jupiter, Saturn, you know, Jupiter is a big cool. planet for a lot of people provide Jupiter uh, observations and they track all the features that are on the, the planetary bodies, uh, the changes and uh, lunar topographical studies is something I like a lot because you can you can do a lot of of uh, measurements of the moon's craters and surface topographical features to measure uh, crater uh, mm -hmm. depths, you know, mountain heights, You've demonstrated all kinds that of a stuff. Few times. You've demonstrated yeah, it's really cool, cool stuff. Program. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And um, that's available to the, anybody that's interested in doing lunar and planetary uh, imaging or just observing. They take uh, visual observations too. That's something I meant, forgot to mention about the AVSO. They, they, uh, they started out as a visual um huh. observing program recorder you know back in the day and they've moved into doing and you know not just uh film imaging but uh ccd imaging and doing, doing measurements with ccd cameras and stuff today they still have a large contingent of members that do visual observations and that's always a good good thing to have two different methods of doing measurements you know you got the visual estimation then you have the camera uh, source for a little more precise measurements, but again, it, they take measurements from anybody, uh, whether you uh, observe with your eyeball or with the camera. Let me see what else. So they've got a lot of sections in ALPO. Uh, if you look on the left here, you'll see uh, solar, Mercury, Venus, of course, the Moon, Mars, all the different, all the different planets, minor mm -hmm. planets, Jupiter, Saturn, remote planets section. Now, remote planets is basically uh, Uranus and Neptune, and I would consider Pluto as part of that. All they did, Pluto is in the minor planet section, and in I would consider the remote planet section. It's in the minor planet section. Yeah, because Pluto's been reclassified as a minor planet it's got a, an id assigned to it and everything and and the thing about pluto is you can't really see surface features like you can on uranus and even neptune they're they, they you know you can see the discs of the planet where pluto you can't really see the disc yeah, it looks star like and yeah it's like icons. a star right so these are planets and the moon that you can see surface features on and that's what they're all about there's a comet section, there's a meteor section, yeah, a meteorite so section, an eclipse section. They haven't created my, unfortunately, they haven't created my Jerry exoplanet Hubble section. section. Yeah, the exoplanet section yet. Oh, the exoplanet. <laughs> yeah, no, not Jerry Hubble section. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but they also have um, other, other groups, other things that are associated. They've got... Um, the computing section and the training section also. They have a training, a separate training section. Oh, they had door prizes too, huh? Well, this is for, so last week or two weeks ago, they had, I guess it was last week, they had their uh, conference and I gave it, I gave a little talk at the conference last week, but but they gave out these door prizes and, and I sent, uh, we gave out a couple of door prizes for their conference. We typically try to do that. Um, one of them we gave last year to a guy, Alberto Anunziato. Anunziato. He was in, um, I think he's in Chile. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to get the eyepiece because he had to pay a huge value added tax or something. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Some import, countries. import tax. That, yeah. uh, so he donated it to a new member this year to, learn, to win. Mm -hmm. So he donated it back to somebody to win this year. So we gave out. Again, that eyepiece and then 
uh, the 6.5. So that's uh, that's something nice. cool. And also, uh, got a, looks like a little camera there from Celestron. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of, yeah. So Celestron gave out their next image camera. Um, and I think those are the only prizes. Uh, there's my talk right there. I talked about the exoplanet section. All right. The, uh, so if you're interested in, in planetary observing and exoplanets, then come to the ALPO. They'll, uh, they're a good place to start. There's a question. Uh, Aaron Thompson has a question. He wants to know, are there videos of those conferences available? Um, there have been in the past. So I think there are presentations. So over here on the left, if you can see that. There are different presentations. They don't have anything recent. Uh, I know that they share the uh, not only the presentations, but have videos also on a couple of things. I don't see the links directly right now to the videos. But I knew Tim Tim Robertson, who's the guy that uh, that's involved with that, um, does a he does a podcast also. Mm -hmm. uh, and these groups are getting into other media. So if you look up, I'm sure if you look up on YouTube, any of these groups, you'll find videos from them. Just like you'll find videos of other astronomy clubs and things like that. Um, the Society for Astronomical Sciences is another uh, group that's really good to join. Now they they don't work they don't uh, specialize in any one object. They're about all celestial objects and also about instruments uh, and the instrumentation that's used to do these observations from your backyard, small telescope, basically small telescope systems. Let me zoom up a little bit more on this. So, these amateur and professional astronomers are using small telescopes and modern instruments to conduct astronomical research in a variety of er areas. So, you talk about it here, you know, asteroids, light curves, occultations, mm -hmm. planets, uh, light curves of stars, astrometry, modest resolution spectroscopy, which we talked about. So the basis for all these groups, science data are the fundamental observations that we talked about in the previous shows, astrometry, photometry, and, and spectroscopy. Once you learn those fundamental skills, then you can you can pick all kinds of different astronomical objects to observe and provide data to these groups. Mm -hmm. um, let me see what else. Yeah, and you're improving the scientific understanding of our universe when you. Yeah, you're contributing right to the to the uh, wealth of knowledge that's out there for future future scientists to use uh, historical data. You know, just think a hundred years from now, your data is going to be out there for scientists to oh, they keep it to look at and and yeah see how you know see what's going on that's right or what the history of an object has been you know it's really cool yeah it's been uh it's been interesting um i think it was not too long ago there was some sort of supernova or some sort of you know tr transient phenomena that happened that occurred and uh they went back to the plate vault uh at Yerkes with the glass plates and they were able to find uh this particular uh yes. of interest I, I forget which one it was but um yeah uh you know keeping you know keeping your data keeping it organized um you know collecting data um you know in a format that scientists can use is important so um because you never know when your telescope might be aimed at this empty patch of uh, sky or at this galaxy and boom you catch a supernova or something you know right so right it happens like that a lot to amateur astronomers and if you're if you're documenting it and recording it wow that's really valuable stuff yeah it is because you get time stamped recordings or time stamped observations that verify and validate your your observation your you know what you've done and that's always important uh, learning those skills uh, to populate to properly document 
observations is really another area that's that's really good to know. Um, even if you're not submitting, even if you're not doing scientific observations, there's a, I know a lot of astronomers keep a logbook of their observations, even and visual observations too, and make drawings and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there are uh, the ALPO, and that just reminds me, the ALPO also takes drawings of astron of planets and lunar and planetary observations. Drawings are very much a part of uh, the database that we, they keep at the ALPO. So if you're, if you're more of an artist and you like to draw, you know, that's a valuable skill also. So does the ALPO have like this big data vault or is it all digitized now or? Well, they have this thing, it's called the gallery, which I've got, you see it right now? Yeah. Let me zoom up on it here. And, They've just transitioned over this over the last couple of years. They've had a gallery for certain um, certain planets uh, for a while, but now they've got everything that gets submitted gets put into this uh, gallery for people to be able to find observations of different things. So, um, for example, let's look at the let's see what Jupiter. So you can see there's a lot of Jupiter. That's some beautiful draw and drawings too. See here. Oh yeah, huh. look at that. That's great. Yeah, so this is the kind of thing that's really popular uh, to provide. Yeah. Now these are these are pretty old. These are look. This is from 1966. 66. Wow. Let me see if I can find any any modern uh, drawings. This is these are the apparitions from 1965, 1962. 1966 and then there's a big gap there that's interesting there's like a there's a 40-year gap there aaron is asking is there a challenge slash testing tutorial for people to figure out if they have a workflow that meets the basics that would be scientifically valid um so there are documents like uh the Minor Planet Center has documents on what the procedures and everything on what's required to be able to submit data to the Minor Planet Center. There's a whole procedure you have to go through. There's a whole certification process you have to go through where you, you, you perform the observations according to the procedures and you have to set your system up for that. Mm -hmm. So you do these observations over several nights, you know, it's not just one observation, it's several ones. And then you submit the data and they do an evaluation of your data, the precision of the data and the quality of the data and your, and your, and basically you train yourself. Uh, although you can get training in some areas of this, and that's something that, that I've been involved with at the MSRO is training our astronomers to do this work. Um, but you have to, you have to be able to provide data of a certain quality and precision that they'll ver they'll validate it and then they'll issue you a an official observatory uh, code okay so they've certified your observatory okay. and that your observatory equipment and your location is is um, has met the requirements to be able to take data now they don't they don't tie it to the person it's tied to the observatory OK, so what the, the assumption there is that if you've got your observatory set, certified, then you have the proper staff to make sure that anything that gets submitted from that observatory code is uh, of sufficient quality to meet the requirements. Uh, if it gets rejected, then it gets rejected. <laughs> But they screen they screen all the data regardless, you know. But in order to submit data from uh, to the Minor Planet Center, you have to submit it with equipment that's uh, been certified at a specific observatory. Mm -hmm. So I've I've been through that process twice with my own personal uh, equipment at my home location, and they certify the location. Okay. So okay. I'm, wherever that observatory is located at, that's part of the that's part you of the get requirement. an observatory number or something. Like yeah, that. you get an observatory number. So my personal one is I twenty four at my at my home location where I observe uh, minor planets, 
the one at Mark Slade Remote Observatory is 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 Whiskey Fifty Four. Okay, mm-hmm. and it's published in the in the Minor Planet Circulars. Whenever a, a new observatory is certified, it's listed inside the circular as a certified observatory. And uh, let me let me see if I can let me see if I can find this real quick. Uh, Wikipedia. Uh, observatory certification. I know they've got observatory. List of observatory codes, okay. Yeah. Here they are, on the left. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll down. Oh, my mouse is getting slow for some reason. I don't know what it's doing. I was trying to load the page. It's a really long page. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So even if I have a small home observatory maybe i built it myself it holds my four inch refractor or whatever i can get an observatory number yes you can go through the process and obtain your observatory code so let me let me go to mine let me go to mine i'll show you okay mine's i24 okay lake of the woods observatory see it right here i see And there I am. Oh, that's where you are, huh? <laughs> cool. You see the lake from where you are? Yeah, I'm, I'm not right on the lake, but I'm a, a road back behind it. So you can find all about my home uh, observatory. Oh, let me go back to it. The other one is, so Mark Slade Remote Observatory is Whiskey 54. Let's see if I can get there from here. It's trying to load the page. That's so really busy. Uh, whiskey 54. Uh, come on. You can see there's all kinds of observatories here. <laughs> hmm. This is, this is one of those dead times during the presentation where. Yeah, we need that kind of, um. Uh... We need some uh, music that they, they play, right. you know, and the Jeopardy music. Alex Trebek would ask a right. question or something, you know. EVW whiskey. Mm-hmm. Mark Slade, there it is right there. Do you see that? Okay. Then Wilderness, Virginia. Wilderness. Um, so I went through the process twice to get the Lake of the Woods Observatory and the Mark Slade Remote Observatory certified, which is kind of cool. Makes it official. Yep. So that's what you have to do if you want to submit data to the Minor Planet Center. And if you go on their website, you'll see under observers, there's an observer uh, menu item. You'll see, you'll find it there, the procedure for that. So Jerry, if if someone is, um, you know, familiar with using their telescope and they enjoy stargazing with their telescope but now they want to take up one of these um you know they want to get involved in doing science it might seem a little intimidating just to join the AAVSO or the alpo and you know yeah right trying to wade through all that stuff is there a program does the msro run a program that would uh basically take them under their wing and um and maybe help them kind of go through the paces of that workflow that Aaron Thompson was talking about. Yeah, we do offer. So at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory, um, we're, we're, it's run by our nonprofit called MSRO Science. Yeah. And we do, we do uh, training, advanced training and research opportunities for amateurs and professionals. Uh, yes, you can, you can uh, absolutely, we will teach you how to, do this work and provide opportunities for you to uh, take data and and submit it uh, 
through our through the MSRO uh, observatory um, and through MSRO Science, we offer that uh, that service uh, to people. So, what uh, is that path like? You join the MSRO, and then there's programs. So there's a couple things involved with, or something. Well, or so as as part of the, there's a couple ways. Uh, one is our astronomy, our local astronomy club, which is the Rappahannock uh, Astronomy Club. Okay. Has has donated resources to the MSRO, and if you join the Rappahannock Astronomy Club, you'll you'll get some access. It's not not a huge amount, but you'll get an introductory access to uh, the MSRO, and you can uh, sit in on observing sessions as a member of the uh, of the Rappahannock Astronomy Club and learn that way. You okay. can also, we also offer uh, training, uh, paid training, where you can purchase uh, training uh, for different tracks uh, to learn about the observatory and how to do observations with the observatory. Now, we offer two tracks on training. One is the equipment track, where you learn about the technology and all the equipment and mm -hmm. how to build your own observatory, basically, is what it comes down to. And that's what my first book was about. And uh, not coincidentally, my first book is the textbook for this training, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, so we offer oh, the, that uh, we scientific imaging book is the textbook. Yes, right. For this? right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, good luck. So, let's see what the training page. So, that's what our state. That's what our one of our training stations looks like. That's station one. Uh, so, this is another book that we use. Uh, remote observatories for amateur astronomers mm -hmm. uh, to do training. And you'll learn all about how to do observations with the system. That's another track. So you can take the um, equipment track or the observing track in the training. Uh, uh, and it's, it, I think the price is pretty reasonable. And again, we're a nonprofit. So anything, uh, any money and don't, donations and any uh, training that we provide people, uh, that money goes directly towards the observatory uh, equipment and operations. So currently none of them, none of the uh, employees or the, or the management of the company take a salary uh, as a nonprofit. Uh, so anything, we're just trying to keep the things up and running and make it available. Um, there is, so any more, any questions about the MSRO? I'm trying to see where's my other page. Well, we got, it looks like Sentil uh, Nagapan will be uh, joining because <laughs> oh, he, cool. he's from Northern Virginia. So. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. So he could That's come great. visit the observatory actually. We, mm -hmm. we do all our training remotely through, uh, the remote access program called Tight VNC. But if you're near to us, you can always come visit the observatory. Because you guys and have people from all over the world learning. Yes. Now, correct? Yep, we do. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. That's very cool. Myron, um, who's the president and the observatory director, I'm the assistant observatory director for the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Myron, Dr. Myron Masuda is the director. He's a leader in terms of uh, and doing training with uh, people from all over the world. We get uh, college students that are working on their, not just their undergraduate degree, but uh, they're, they're working on a graduate degree, use our systems uh, to do observations, um, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, very so, cool. Yep. So, um... Uh, the last thing I want to go over real quick is that sure. there is a, there is a professional. This is the main professional pro am group that we're involved with at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory is the is the test follow up observing program. Uh, again, we had to go through a process of applying to join that team. They want to see what kind of observations you can get. They they want to verify the quality of your observations. Basically, they don't they don't just take. Um, they don't just take every observation they get of an exoplanet. They have to meet a certain quality requirement and also meet a certain um, precision because the purpose of the observations is to do modeling 
of the system of the exoplanet system so that they can uh, calculate the orbit and you know calculate a mass all kinds of things like that that require very precise observations so even observations amateurs can do basic observations of exoplanets there's two levels there's a detection observation then there's a you know a measurement observation the detection just means yes i saw the i saw the exoplanet transit at this time there's no measurement involved it's just a detection the higher precision value is when you do a measurement and that's what we're involved with and that's what the test team uh follow-up uh, working group requires is, is to be able to do precision measurements and uh so this is this is the i'm going to post this i'm going to copy this link okay to the uh to the and then people can look into that if they're really interested in what's what what's that's exoplanets i mean that is so this cutting is, this is professional this is professional exoplanet observations from your backyard right and and i wrote an article about that that was in astronomy magazine last year in june if you haven't seen that if people haven't seen that do you remember which month that might have been i think it was june Oh, June, 20, said June. <laughs> June, yeah, June of 2020, I think is when it came out. Right. Uh. That's cool. So, so, you know, if, if you're, if you're someone that loves astronomy, you've got a telescope, uh, you've, um, you know, no matter whether you're strictly a visual observer or you're learning astrophotography, you can start to collect and document science data and, um, you know, so I, I would think that a nice path would be something like, uh, yeah, you belong to your your local astronomy club or one of the national clubs. Uh, maybe you're a member at large to the Astronomical League. You know, there you're going to get the you're going to be in a, a community like this one. Okay, that this is Explore Alliance, and so this is mm -hmm. our effectively our club, right? So right. Um, but uh, you're going to have people that you can call upon and connect with, okay, to start to understand how to improve your skills to, to effectively be at the level of a professional astronomer, you know, with right. your gear. Uh, I would say the next logical step would be, you know, join up with MSRO, either through the Rappianic uh, group, which is very affordable, or you, you, you take it up a notch and you just join MSRO directly, you know, and, um, right. And, and they, then we train you. Yeah. Um, and then they give you like the deep yeah. training, you know, that right. you really need because you just, just to kind of slug this out on your own and try to go through the math and stuff. If you're not, if you're not a math whiz, you know, they, <laughs> they have people like Jerry that are <laughs> okay. And so, uh, you know, they can help step you through, um, uh, you know, statistical analysis and, and how to work with this, this data to put it into your workflow uh, to work with the software that's out there. And then, you know, yes. once your quality is up, then you get, then you approach like the American Astronomical Society, which is going to have a ton of, uh, of uh, pro-am projects, uh, you know, they have some right now. I guarantee you they're gonna be adding more. They need, um, they need right. the amateur community uh, to do this because there's just so much being uh, discovered. Discovered. Mm -hmm. So many follow-on observations have to be made. Yeah, know, that's right. Which that's the biggest they thing. Frankly, Amateurs... don't have the time to do, you know? No, so... and, and professionals are, are geared towards discovery because they have the high dollar equipment that can do discovery. Unfortunately, amateur equipment anymore really can't do a whole lot of more discovery. Uh, we've been overshadowed, Although but amateurs do discoveries. They still know. discover things. That's right. And still, still people discover things. Um, yeah. And the more often you're out under the sky, the more you're going to get a chance to discover something. Now that doesn't mean you can't discover something doing follow-up work either. So one of the things that, it's really important True. with the follow-up work is to make sure you keep track of of what's going on with the object right that's the whole purpose of the follow-up work now so you're looking for changes so if there's changes that occur in the object you're observing like minor planet maybe they change it changes its orbit yeah and you discover and you've you've contributed an observation that helps discover that or mm -hmm. or even an exoplanet if it's changed its uh, you know its revolution period for some reason it's an indication of something else going on in that system and you discovered there's a change in the ephemeris for that exoplanet that's yeah. pretty exciting 
Yeah. You know, that's really. And so you know, the media something. loves, they just love to uh, bring uh, the, the spotlight on an amateur astronomer when they've made, uh, you know, some sort of important um, discovery, uh, whether it's the first time to see anything or, or like a, a new behavior or a feature right. or something right. like that, which, um, you know, it, it's these, these follow on observations are ripe for, for getting, uh, you know, uh, allowing you to uh, make some con significant contribution like that. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's fun, you know, to, um, to uh, get recognized like that. Um, you know, my, my, uh, uh, really the only time I, I've encouraged lots of people to do pro-am work, but you know, we're, we're kind of stuck back here building telescopes and selling telescopes, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on both sides. You know, I, I don't have a time. <laughs> yeah, You're right it. on the fence. You are, you know, so <laughs> I don't have time for everything I want to do basically. That's right. That's right. But, um, uh, you had a good solid basis to start from. So mm -hmm. as a, you know, technician and scientist, so, um, for those of us who want to be scientists, um, you know, there, there's going to have to be some mentoring, you know, somebody's going to have to take you under their wing. I'm just here to tell you that those resources exist, uh, right here on this program. So, you know, you can get involved, um, and, uh, uh, and make those kinds of things. If you find out that's not your cup of tea, you want to step back and just enjoy making beautiful pictures or just, uh, soak up, uh, the the uh, you know the the starry skies that that's great too you know yeah, I've got a secret. It all. you can I've do it a, all I've got a secret that probably some of your some of our audience knows already I've talked about it in the past you don't have to be as you don't have to be as good to be a scientist as a beautiful picture taker <laughs> your observations scientific observations are valid even even if they're less quality than these beautiful pictures, Even, these world-class yes, beautiful pictures. Images, yeah, the, the, a lot of, uh, you know, the so-called high-end astrophotographers, they'd never consider that image, they'd throw it away. Right? No, right, exactly. They so might we have gathered, like a discovery on it, but boom, it's gone. <laughs> now it's, the thing about these so somewhat ugly pictures, right? They're, they're rich with data and that's the whole key. You know, how do you, exam how do you look at these images? You look at them, at, at them at a to with a totally different point of view. Yes. You're not looking how pretty they are, how colorful or whatever, you know, how beautiful they are. You're looking at what is the precision of the data that's in them? How has how has the data been calibrated? How has it been managed? Mm -hmm. You know, that's so you're basically the, the science data you take with your images is totally the opposite of what you do to turn an image into a beautiful picture. You would never distort the data to make it pretty. Right. With a science science image. So that and and the scene. You know, people talk about seeing and being up on a mountain to get the best stars, the perfect round stars. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing photometric measurements, and we talked about this in the past episodes, mm -hmm. when you're doing photometry, you don't care if you have a blobby star. <laughs> no. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not germane. It doesn't matter because, because you're just measuring the light intensity. You don't care about the shape of it necessarily or or how big the blob is you just want to know that you've gathered all the light accurately that's what it matters that's what matters mm -hmm. so it's easier i guess what i'm saying is it's almost easier to be a scientist than a pretty picture taker well it probably <laughs> is yeah you're not going to be spending <laughs> hundreds of hours uh, no you know or tens of hours or whatever you know no, the, the most data, and you're right. not going to be you know image processing for weeks you know a lot so. of the basic astrometry measurements and even basic photometry measurements you can do uh a f in a few minutes you can learn to do it and then create do all your uh, analysis in like a half an hour to an hour that the most analysis i've done so far is dealing with the exoplanet data where you're doing these very precise measurements and you're trying to model the system so that you understand the mass and the size of the planet and that type of stuff. And it, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's very, it's a parallel track to what you do when you do these processing pretty pictures, you, you're mm -hmm. tweaking little things and you're making it better, but you're, you're basically peering into the data to get as much information out of it as you can. 
so that's that's the tedious part of doing exoplanet observations with the analysis. And that would be that would be similar to what you do when you process beautiful pictures and getting the you know the perfect stars and the great colors and everything else. Sure. Great. Well, that's that's about Great, it. Jerry, any, well, thank any you. other questions? Yeah, it's been a long. I guess it's been an hour and a half program. So yeah, <laughs> that's all right. There's a lot to cover. There's a lot to I mean, cover, right? Yeah, there so, is. I mean, so all cover. these programs I did the last few weeks or a couple of months actually, that's like ten hours worth of programming right there, right? That's right. That's, that's right. a lot. Good. That's that's a whole day and a half worth of training. Just you know, already. That's right. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they got it for free, right? Yep. <laughs> And that didn't even scratch the surface. <laughs> I could spend a week just on one of those topics, probably. If a little I really niggle. To. Yeah. 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 Well, that's okay. That's what, that's what it's all about. So, mm -hmm. um, well, great. Uh, hopefully some of you are turned on to the idea of uh, preparing to become a real, you know, astronomer scientist, you know, uh, and taking, taking your astronomy up uh, the next level. And you can do that. You know what? You can do that starting out as a rank beginner, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and get trained and, um, uh, you know, and you're going to understand the sky, like a lot of amateur astronomers still don't really understand, you know, so mm -hmm. um, because you would have done the work, you know, so that's, it, it will give you insights into nature, you know, which is really cool. Uh, we're able to post says, Scott tell Jerry. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <You're up. laughs> well, my cowboy hats over there, so I can't do it. And, uh, were you able to post that test website? The follow up. Uh, I put I, it in the I chat. Did. Let's do that. Let's do that. I didn't know if you, I didn't say anything when I posted it to the chat. Can my son get involved in MSRO? He's 12. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just as long as he can reach uh, the keyboard of his computer, he's he's good to go. Right. You we know? can introduce him to the uh, equipment and the and what we do there. That'd be a great uh, thing for a twelve-year-old to get to start get started. Absolutely. Yeah. He'd have a nice head start, right? Yeah, and then he then he'll. He'll be up on what questions to ask when he goes to star parties with these amateurs and their equipment. He'll ask them all kinds of questions about, well, do you have this or how you do that? You know, that type of thing. Yep. Look, Davey says he's going to be a real boy one day. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a throwback to Pinocchio, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, it's great. You guys are a great audience today. And um, uh, we have, uh, again, Global Star Party tonight. Uh, great lineup. Uh, Dave Eicher has been, gosh, he's been giving just like him and David Levy both have been doing lots of um, online lectures and stuff like that. So, you know, you guys want, definitely want to support them tonight uh, by watching and liking and sharing and subscribing you know, and um, uh, uh, we have um, uh, Robert Garfinkel is going to be on. Robert is a, Bob Garfinkel is a author of lots of astronomy books. And um, so uh, definitely want to catch his uh, segment. Um, we've got uh, Cesar and Maxi and Nico from uh, Argentina are going to be on. Uh, Jerry's going to be on. I'll be there, you know. And we got more. We got more yep, than that. Yep. So it should be a nice uh, global star party. And um, uh, Terex just now coming in. He says, I came in late. I just keep watching or listening or as I don't understand the topic. But thank you very much. <laughs> Terex, we're always here to well, take you along with us. So yeah, whatever worry. questions you have, if you just send us your question. If you watch the video later, you know, yeah. send us your question. Yeah. 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 We're right here for you. So. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm, I can't right now. I, I've got to wait for Myron to get home uh, because I I can't connect to the MSRO right now. Something's down with the internet connection there. You're only four and, miles uh, out, right? You can just go. Yeah, over. I can go over there and do it, but he's going to be home for too long. He'll be home. And, uh, 
And uh, right. what time is it? It's eight thirty now. He'll be home in about forty five minutes. So okay, I'm All gonna right. get on then and um, and get it started up. It looks like we All got right. a clear clear sky tonight. I want to thank. I got Aaron's message. I knew he was in the audience. He said something yeah. earlier, so I got your your text message. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Aaron's been uh, quite the contributor, so that's great. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, as our friend Jack Hork Horkheimer always used to say, keep looking up. And um, I'm going to have to drink some more coffee for tonight. You know, I'm still kind of, I worked really late last night. I was up till about 2.30 in the morning working. So, um, but I'm excited about tonight and I'm excited about tomorrow too, because of uh, having the uh, Voyager mission, uh, you know, people coming on and, um, uh, you know, and we have seven months of science with Caitlin Ahrens. So there's quite a bit going on. Cameron Gillis will be on tomorrow as well. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a very nice, um, uh, you know, evening long event or series of events. So want to stay tuned and uh, we'll be back in a, couple of hours, so take care. Here's the Explore Scientific IXOS 100 equatorial tracker mount. Uh, we've got it mounted up here with a digital SLR that's got the uh, uh, dovetail plate here. We also have it kind of mounted on our extra, extra heavy duty tripod. Uh, but uh, this, this whole thing is operated remotely. You can see Ken's operating it with uh, his uh, Apple tablet here. Uh, but it'll run off a Windows tablet or an Android tablet. What do you like about this whole system, Kent? I find it very intuitive. It's very quiet. Um, like any go-to system, there are things to learn. Sure. But once you learn those things, it makes it really easy to find stuff in the sky. Sure. Now, this is running our Explore Stars app. If you're going to do astrophotography, you need to be running it with a planetarium program, hardwired to a computer. That's right. ASCOM so this runs program. wireless, wired, okay? It's super versatile. It not only has go-to uh, capabilities, but uh, you can also add a, um, a guide scope with an auto guider CCD type of camera onto it. So, uh, and you know, the thing that you're gonna really love about this is the price of this instrument, um, which will fit neatly into your uh, budget, I'm sure. So uh, check it out, look online, check out the specs, give us a call if you have any questions. <laughs>